It's time for Your Voices of Hope, a video podcast program that offers straight talk on some of the major issues facing us today. Addiction, domestic violence, homelessness, human trafficking, and suicide. But more than that, it's our desire to inspire hope. Now, your host, Michelle Beyer. Welcome to Your Voices of Hope. I am your host, Michelle Beyer. Today, my guest is Linda Petra. Her son, Jesse, died of an overdose of heroin back in May of 2016, leaving behind, of course, his mom and his dad uh, and his um, daughter, Charlie, who was eight months old at the time. And um, Linda and I go back to high school back in New Jersey. And actually, this is probably like one of the first times we're seeing each other live. So welcome to the show, Linda. And uh, how are you this morning? Hopefully your nerves are a little bit okay. Yeah, my nerves are okay. I'm wondering if I'm going to get emotional. Um, Like I said earlier, I am just thinking that I'm talking to an old friend because we do go way back. And probably last time we saw each other was at the waiting room. Maybe like within 10 years. It hasn't been that long. That's long. I guess it is. (laughs) Not when you're in your 50s. Oh, gosh. Thanks. Let's remind each other that we're, (laughs) gosh, I'm going to be 53. I'm already there. (laughs) (laughs) But we don't look it. And I don't know about you. I don't feel it. No, I don't feel it either. It's crazy. So, thank God. So, So tell me about Jesse as your little baby when he was, you know, a little boy and growing up. Well, Jesse was always a mama's boy, self-proclaimed. His girlfriends always told me that he said that. Um, He was very thoughtful, very um, sensitive. Um, When he was young, he was very serious. He always had that look in his eye where he was taking everything in. Um, as he got older, he did develop some anxiety, some depression, which played into part of um, his drug use. Um, in high school, though, he was the class clown. He was voted um, the, what's that word? The, um, something of the party, the whatever. The life of the party? The life of the party. That's what his, um, that he was voted in senior year. Um, so most people knew him as a comedian and um, as being very, very funny. But those that knew him really well knew that he was struggling with depression and anxiety. That is so common that you hear that, you know, like Robin Williams. Exactly. Life of the party. They make you laugh. And And he passed around the same time as Jesse did, too. Yes, that's right. Uh, I remember being on air. Um, I did a a special show that day. that yeah and that was um and and i had someone on my show that day that knew him and you know said first of all how humble he was but that he always was always trying to make you laugh and so this is a a trait which scares me because i'm raising a little boy right now that does that class clown so and he has a lot to be depressed about so um so did you ever see any kind of mental health issues that would, did you get him any medications and bring him to a doctor and all that? Oh yeah, from a young age, probably um, maybe fourth, fifth grade, as young as that. Um, definitely all through high school, he was under a doctor's care. Um, I always think back that maybe that kind of led towards his problems too, because he was diagnosed with ADHD later though in high school, not when he was young. Um, but every time he went to a different doctor, when he was going through different things, they would prescribe medica- medication. So he's always medicated himself and he never learned how to deal with his problems. We tried um, having a psychiatrist even come to the house when he was younger, maybe in middle school thinking maybe being at his own in his own room his own place he would open up to somebody 
but he wouldn't. Um, and we would send him to different therapies and he would never open up to anybody, but he'd go, of course, to get the medications, um, which should have been a huge red flag at the time, but you only see really what you want to see and you're able to see at the time. Um, so I think he, you know, as he got older, the only thing he knew to do was to medicate. And that's what he started with the partying, the drinking, the smoking pot. And I'm sure eventually that's what led to the heroin. Which was my next question. When did he start, did he start drinking and, you know, um, what was his, but what think- led up? He, he probably started partying around like an average age of, of, of what teenagers do. Um, probably around 14 or 15 was the first time that, um, you know, I had to talk to him about it and, um, you know, found a beer at the house or, or, or things like that. Um, but I really just thought that's what it was, just typical. I didn't treat it typically, you know. I, I did ground him, punish him, and have talks with him about it because I knew that it could be very serious. Um, But yeah, and anytime I saw something going on, I could only let myself believe that it was the depression and the anxiety. Though in the back of my mind, I was always concerned that it was um, severe drug use because there were a lot of indications. There were times that he lost so much weight that he was so skinny and and looked unhealthy. He was unable to go to school for periods of time, but again, he was under a doctor's care, so I just believed what they told me. Um, What did they tell you? Well, to be honest, um, there were a couple of doctors that told me he really needs to talk to somebody, but I couldn't make him talk. Yeah, how do you make him talk? And there was a lot, you know, long, long periods of time where he seemed happy and healthy and was working out and, um, you know, he he went to college. Um, He didn't stick with it, but but he went. He did well in school. Um, He had lots of friends. He was very social. So there was a lot to... um, you know, let me believe that he's going to be okay. You know, he, you know, before he passed away, he was working for my husband, Gene, the business, and he had all these great ideas. And my husband was so proud of him. He was doing amazing and he looked amazing. He was working out. He really built himself up and, you know. When did you know that it was serious? I guess in, um, 2000, 15, um, he, I, I knew something was going on, but again, I just kept telling myself it was the anxiety and the depression. And I actually remember, um, the, the night that he called me, he texted me on the phone. I was upstairs and he was in his room and he said, I really need to talk to you. And I, I went into his room and he, he told me, he said, you know, mom, um, I have an addiction problem. And I knew I said, heroin. And he said, yes. But I remember after talking to him a little bit, you know, I said to him, honey, we're going to beat this. We got this. And call rehab tomorrow, get you into rehab. You have my support. Um, and I remember going upstairs and just thinking to myself, thank God he said it. I kind of knew it, but I wasn't ready to face it. And I was so thankful that he finally said it because now I knew what it was and I knew I could help him and fix it. So um, the next day I I called the rehab. Thank goodness we had good insurance. I got him right in that day. Um, Not only did he go to a 28 day program, but while he was there, um, I knew he needed to go for extended care. We were going to Naranon and getting ourselves educated on what we needed to do to help him. And I knew 28 days does not cut it, does not keep you clean. Um, So while he was there, they had an extended program that was, uh, um, I think it was a three month program in Pennsylvania and uh, he wanted to go and we we're like, go, we had to pay out of pocket almost $40,000, but we paid and, and he went and he came home maybe a week earlier than he was supposed to. Everybody kept telling me when he called, don't let him come home. And I kept saying to myself, it's only a week. What's a week going to do? He, he's homesick. He wants me. I, I, I want him with me. I want to help him. Um, I was afraid if I said no, that he was going to get pissed and mad. It was going to be an excuse to use again. And he would go out on the streets or to a friend's house. And I would not know what he was doing. And we'd back to square one. I felt like, I felt like if at least he came into our house, I would be there for him. And I could see him and watch him and know that he's okay. So I let him come home. 
and he came home in the middle of the summer and by September I had him at a detox again. Now did he start with pills and do you know and where did he get them? I mean what did he hurt himself? Was it an injury? What? No. How did no, I think it was, it was just really all depression, um, anxiety. Um, so he just bought the pills and just started with the pills, or did he just start with the heroin? No, he started with the pills because I knew of a time when he was taking pills. He told me to. And I think he was um, really playing around with the medications the um, psychiatrists were giving him to. He was definitely overtaking those, taking them too much, and then he would tell me he left them at a friend's house, or he lost them, and he needed more, and we went through all of that. Okay, that, and so um, after all of that, uh, you have him in detox. What is going on after that? Um, so he, he goes to detox probably by the, the end of that summer, like September, um, comes out, maybe he, and just detox, and comes back out, goes back to detox. Um, I couldn't get him at that point to go back to a rehab. Oh, maybe, well, it, it, it's really hard to remember, but eventually he did go back to a rehab. Um, he only stayed the 30 days, and then he also did an IOP. He did that for a very long time. Um, so that was an intense outpatient program where he um, would go four nights a week after work from, I don't know, it was like five to nine every night. Um, and he was doing really good. Um, and prior to him passing, he was really doing good for um, close to a year. There was a slip here and there, you know. His, his girlfriend was really good. I, we always tell her that she'd make an excellent detective because she always found out everything. Um, so there were times that we knew that he, he took a pill or he drank or he did this or that. But um, for the most part, he was doing really well. He was able to go to work every day. He looked healthy, seemed health, healthy, um, was working out. So um, it was a shock when I got the call that he OD'd because I really thought that he was clean. How old was he? 22. 22. And during this time, he had a daughter, Charlie. And how was he during the time of, you know, the eight month period? So obviously all this detoxing and, and all that happened during her eight months. Um, so during the eight months was probably the most time that he had clean. Okay. He, he was he was done. He might have still been in the um, IOP program, but for the most part of that, he was clean. I really believe too that the love he had for her and the responsibility was going to help him. But heroin is one of the strongest drugs to get off of. Yeah. Um, it just it's the devil just, you want me, you want me, you can't live without me. Um, you know, my addiction was different. I mean, addiction is addiction. A drug is a drug, but I don't necessarily believe that with heroin. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't. Yeah. Um, yeah, if anybody was going to get clean, it was him. He had the desire, he had the support. None of the, the none of what he went through um, I never had to kick him out. People say kick him out, but anytime I said, hey, I know you're doing this, you know, you're going to have to leave if you don't get help. He always got help. He did every single thing we asked him to, to, to do. He tried, um, mm -hmm. you know, and it, he had support by his, his father, from me, his, his, his whole entire family and all his friends. It wasn't as if we didn't believe in him. Well, the only time i mean and i'm one that don't enable you know but i only say that when they're stealing from you yeah, exactly. you know and using you and all that other than i see in this situation i would trying. yeah it's not enabling if they're trying yeah i would never say that in this situation because he was trying he wasn't stealing and he wasn't just using you so i would never think that so you know um in an alley or even in a car um, 
Yeah, I couldn't live with myself. So you get that horrifying phone call that nobody, no parent should ever get um, what are the next few weeks, months like for you? Um, I can't imagine, and he's your only child, correct? Yeah, well, I have a stepson, Neil. Um, right. Jesse's my only biological child, yes. Um, Gosh, yeah, I, you know, I remember getting the phone call and just the, the feeling inside is indescribable. You can't describe what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Um, I, I was shocked to know that he OD'd. Um, and we were down the shore um, at our boat. So we were like an hour and a half when we were getting the phone calls from family and friends. And um, he had a lot of family and friends with him at the hospital and they were waiting for us to get there. They had to revive him, Narcan him like 15 times just to keep him alive till we can get there. And then um, once I was there, you know, they told me he was dead and they wanted to stop reviving him. I was the only one that had my wits about me so that I could have this conversation with um, the doctors and the nurses. And uh, all kept going through my mind is as much as I didn't want to lose him, I didn't want him in pain anymore. So I gave the okay. And then uh, the days and weeks that follow, of course, are a complete blur. Um, I do know that my saving grace was that his girlfriend, um, Devin, and she has a son that called Jesse daddy. So Devin was living with us along with her children. So she had Riley at the time who was two, who thought of Jesse as his daddy. Um, and then of course, um, my granddaughter, Charlie, who was eight months old. And when Jesse passed, um, you know, my husband completely lost it. Um, Devin completely lost it. And then I had these two babies in the house. And I always, you know, they were like a saving grace for me because I had to try to give them a normal life because everything around them just completely fell apart. So I'd actually get up in the morning and say to them, come on, daddy wants us to go to the park and, and Devin couldn't even get out of bed. And I kept them dressed, put them in the stroller and try to take them to the park and just stay busy with them. I think that's what I did to get through the first year. So I just concentrated on them. And that's how I got through. Devin um, had a couple of losses at the time, so she ended up having to go in, uh, away for help two different times, as well as doing outpatient type things. My husband ended up going away for treatment um, for the depression and the trauma from the grief. And uh, my grandson's in grief counseling, both um, uh, privately and through the school. So it's hit my family really hard. Of course, uh, I've um, sat with many families and uh, the devastation that this causes is sometimes so devastating, they don't come back right. from it. Um, I still see my mom we lost my little sister at the age of 30 and it wasn't to drugs and my mom has never recovered, you know, and, and this is way long ago uh, in 07 and she's never, she's never been the same. And it's so, um, but so a year passes and I know that just from hearing little things that, you're now a, an advocate. Yeah. And you've I, spoken a lot. So tell me about that. Well, I, I haven't spoken a lot, but I have, I have um, spoke at events. Um, right after Jesse passed away, um, a lady in the community reached out to me, and her name is Kim Sieber. Um, and she's amazing. Um, her son had struggled. Thank goodness he's been in long term recovery now. But when she found out that he was struggling with addiction, 
Um, she always says it was like a punch in the gut, but she's one of those people that she just knew she had to do something. She had to make a change. So she started um, a Facebook page called uh, Roots to Addiction for family members and those that are uh, suffering from addiction. And she also holds um, the Fed Up events locally. Fed Up is an organization that's nationwide. Um, and every year on Overdose Awareness Day, which is August 31st, a lot of communities will hold uh, yes. speech, you know, have speech, speakers right. and all types of community events um, to honor those that we lost to um, overdose. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Jesse passed in May. Within a, uh, a month later, she reached out to me, told me who she was, how she wanted to make a change in our town. I'm a teacher. I went through, you know, I've been teaching at South Amboy uh, for 24 years. Jesse went through South Amboy schools from kindergarten to graduation. Um, and she just thought that we really had a message to share that would really make an impact on the community, that people would really listen to us and it would even help with the stigma that this happens to good people. This happens to um, good families. You know, addiction does not discriminate. Um, so she kind of took me under her wing. We even went to a couple of council meetings, um, met with the mayor, um, uh, the chief of police in town. Um, and then I spoke at the Fed Up events on um, August uh, 31st, like three years in a row. I spoke at our high school um, to the high school students and shared their smart story. And um, I've spoke at libraries from different committees that have asked me to come and speak. I started a, um, a Facebook uh, page for people that have lost somebody to addiction. It's like a sister page to Kim's page, Roots to Addiction. Mine is called, um, uh, well, it's the grieving page for Roots to Addiction. Um, yeah, a couple times, a couple speeches I wrote, people published them in, um, in the local newspaper. Um, I try to post things on Facebook, you know, trying to advocate and show people to that again, that this does happen to good families. It can happen to anybody. Um, when you're talking about earlier about um, your mom losing some, you know, your sister, and I'm so sorry about that. My heart goes out to her because I know how devastating it is. And then I just feel bad for people um, that have lost somebody to addiction because it, it's it's a little different. You know, it's a little different. People judge you. Yes, it's not the same loss. they do. Some people think Jesse asked for it. He wanted it. It was his decision, and he got what he deserved. Yes. And that's hard to hear. It, it is. You know, people will say that to me. <laughs> and, or they say this. You don't look like an alcoholic, drug addict, or that you were in jail. No way. Why? This is exactly how I looked when I went to jail. As a matter of fact, the judge said to me, you walked into my courtroom all hoity-toity, you know, I'm going to make you look like every other prisoner, you know. Wow. It, it, addiction doesn't have a look. No. It, it doesn't discriminate, mm -hmm. and, as you had said, and there is a stigma to it. And I would say, look, you drink. You're drinking right now. If I was to pick up a drink it would be over with mm -hmm. that one drink's going to turn in to many many more right because i have a disease it's like an allergy right. right and that's a whole other debate you get into with everybody is it a disease isn't it a disease it is a disease 100 percent. you can say yes. it's not but it's documented it's a scientific fact or medical fact it is Yes. And I, <laughs> I had a doctor from Florida on my radio show, and I'm so thankful that it was recorded um, because I was able to edit it. <laughs> <laughs> because when she said, I don't believe it's a disease, I I blew up at her um, and there were, it was a Christian radio station. So I had to edit certain pieces of it. <laughs> um, but I said, you are the reason 
that we are fighting so hard. And of course, there was more choice little words. Yeah. So, exactly. And that's true, too, because I feel like with, with Jesse, there was a, such a stigma to his addiction that he couldn't share it with, with other people. And I'm sure he even felt embarrassed, even with me, you know, even as close as we were, he just wanted me to think he was better, that he was okay. He did not want me to worry about him. He did not. So, you know, he always told me he was okay. He always told me he got it. He always told me he can make it. He never really was in touch to how difficult it was for him. And I, and part of that is the stigma behind it. Fast forward, May 29th. 2020. Ooh. We are right there. We are right there. It's been a tough month. I just had Mother's Day. That gets me every year. I have no idea how I'll be on the anniversary of his passing. It'll be four years. Blows my mind. Um, I don't know. Do you do anything? What have you done in the past? Um, I know that there's people that I've spoken to that will go do something that was their favorite thing to do, um, whether it's their favorite restaurant, an amusement park or something. Do you do anything or do you just, you have to be alone? And It, it, it depends on, I guess, how we're feeling. It's been different every time. His birthday is another one um, that, of course, is really tough. Um, most of the time, we've done like the, the pay it forward thing. Go to Dunkin' Donuts or wherever it is, we pay it forward. I often make some kind of um, contribution um, to a local shelter. Um, I've donated clothes, something to do something positive. There's been times that we release balloons. I know balloons are, are, are bad, but this was back in the beginning when we didn't realize, you know, how bad they were for the environment. We had the kids. We had gone and had pizza, which was his favorite food, and played basketball in the backyard, you know, and done things like that. Um, I'm a positive person. That's what helped me get through. So I always try to do something positive. I think that's what's helped me with my grief, too, um, is that I know he was so guilty when he was here living um, and he felt so bad that he was struggling so hard. I think he was more concerned about how we felt more so than how he felt. So I always feel like I want to live a life that he's, that he's proud when he looks at me. He doesn't feel guilty. If I walked around crying all the time or I was unable to contribute to society or, or do positive things, I think that would just make him feel worse. And I believe he's with me and I believe he's watching me. Everything how does uh, Charlie, I mean, she, how is she today? What does she think? What does she know? I just lost sound on you. Um, we just lost sound for a moment there. Um, internet is a beautiful thing here. Um, so, so start uh, over a little bit with Charlie. Yeah. So you're gonna have to start over with the answer about Charlie. Cause All I right. just lost the whole thing. Charlie, um, what I started to say was she's very funny. She's very silly. We call her a little hippie. She just wants everybody to laugh and to be happy. She loves to laugh and to be happy herself. She doesn't remember Jessie because she was eight months old. But honestly, like you hear people say, she will tell us stories from, some, from time to time, especially when she was younger, that daddy came and played with me. I played dolls with daddy, or I, I saw daddy. Um, there was a time that um, her brother knew Jessie as daddy and had asked, what was daddy's real name? And Charlie says, Jessie, his name's Jessie. Like, you know, she picks up on a lot, and I, and I believe that there are times that he was really with her. Does it scare you and Devin, is, that's the mother's name for, of Charlie, that Charlie will f not follow, but have these addiction problems, especially? 100%. Right. Devin, Devin's doing a good job, though. She really is. Um, 
when she when she knew she needed help, she got help for herself. She's still getting help. She she still speaks to somebody, you know, a professional, um, and she's doing everything that that she should be doing. Um, Charlie has not shown any signs. She's four now. She hasn't shown any signs of trauma or grief or depression or any of that. So um, there's been no need to seek treatment for for Charlie. Um, again, Riley's a different story. He's been through a lot. So um, and he he expresses it, verbalizes it, but she makes sure that he's getting, um, you know, he's her too, and he's getting treated. So, okay. so yeah, we, we're, we're definitely afraid of, you know, what's going to happen. But she's doing the right thing. She's getting them young, which is what we need to do. And that's for sure the, the right thing to do. Um, you know, I have uh, taken um, a course. I'm actually certified. Um, in uh, my mind went blank, but I'm I'm a certified prevention specialist. Uh, so, you know, doing the right thing at the right ages is so helpful. Um, and there's so much wrong information, especially with like there's so many commercials and there's so much stuff going on. But what you're doing is is perfect. And abstinence in the family is, you know, perfect because if you normalize drinking mm -hmm. and a lot of parents do, and they don't understand that normalizing it is not, right. know, and we do, we normalized it, you know, well, I definitely did when he was a teenager. I mean, I saw him and I would ground him, but I wasn't really that upset. I drank when I was little. I didn't have a pro, you know, when I was, right. little, I didn't have a problem, but right. I mean, as Catholics, and, and I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, um, I'm, I'm Christian, um, but you do Holy Communion, First Holy Communion, and, and you take sips of wine and you teach your children that, and I did that with my children, mm -hmm. and, and so it's just so, nor and Italians, here's some wine, kids. Yeah. <laughs> But now as we progress, we know more than we did. Right. And so Charlie stands a better chance. Yeah, I think than, so. than we did. Um, so Linda, if there's one thing you can leave this show with telling people, what would that be? Oh, wow, great question. Um, and now my mind, my mind is going blank. Uh, I, I guess what comes to mind is honestly, I, for all the parents out there, never think it can happen to your child. You can be doing all the right things and have a, you know, our marriage was great. We both are professionals. We owned a house. Like, I mean, it wasn't supposed to happen to us and it did. It wasn't supposed to happen to him and it did. And, um, that is the thing that we've been trying to tell people that it can happen to anyone. Yeah, never and seen child. this, and right now, heroin has actually taken a bit of a back seat and it's moved on to meth. Mm -hmm. And it is being still, that's laced with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so, it's just as dangerous. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. The answers are except for start young. So you have to start talking to them young, dealing with their trauma and grief young. I thought Jesse was going to grow out of it. I just thought he was going to be okay because why, how could something that horrible happen to me or my family? And that was right. so naive of me to think of that. I should have fought a little bit harder. You, how would you know? I so, know. You wouldn't know. But uh, Linda, I want to thank you for coming on to my show today. Thanks and for giving sharing. Me the it really sharing means your a lot story. for me to, to, yeah. I hope that somebody listens. I change somebody's mind about what addiction is in some shape or form. And, and I, that's why I do this is because I know we make difference just one person maybe hearing this mm -hmm. 
and and I know that it works. I I used to get the letters and the phone calls, so I know this works. Absolutely, yeah. And so there's someone out there that needs to hear this, right. and I and I just thank you so much for sharing your private life with a lot of people. <laughs> and um, thank you for doing what you do and giving us a place where we can share our stories in order to help other people. Well, you're, 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 you're very welcome. And I want to thank all of you for listening to another episode of your voices of hope. And if you would like to be a guest on my show, then please go to your voices of hope.com scroll down to the bottom of the page and there is a form you can fill out or you can go to my Facebook page, which is Your Voices of Hope, and go to the message section and message me. And we will schedule you for a meeting here. And have a wonderful day. And the one thing I always want you to remember is to love yourself. And have a great day. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Your Voices of Hope with your host, Michelle Beyer. This podcast and earlier programs are available for viewing on our Facebook page, Your Voices of Hope, or our website, yourvoicesofhope.com. A new podcast is uploaded and ready to view every Wednesday at 7 o'clock p.m.